Hi, yeah, so I'm going to run through this. This is a paper two. This is an OCR gateway. This is a combined science paper, but it's still really useful for all triple and all specifications. It's really, really useful for you. I'm going to jump straight in. There's been a couple of points people are making that maybe some of this is um, a little bit too easy for them, which is great. You know, we're all pleased for you if this is uh, <laughs> pretty too easy for you. That's really good. But there are some really tricky ones in this, actually. There are some really tricky questions in this. So um, jump on in if you like that. Some people like in my handwriting, that's good. If you are a um, A-level student, then there's some just some uh, suggested videos in the description for you, so off you go. Somebody asked if I will do similar things for A-level. Um, yes, I absolutely will. Perhaps tomorrow I'll focus on A-level questions, um, if you fancy that. Okay, so without further ado, I'm gonna jump into the visualizer now. Uh, let's just get through this as quickly as possible. If you've got any questions, then by all means ask and um, I will get to them at the end. I'm going to focus on doing this so that for people watching this playback, it's um, you know pretty much straight through, straightforward video. So with multiple choice, I will always suggest you try and do the question before you actually look at the answers because they will be writing those questions, writing those answers to try and distract you. Where people are going to make a mistake on this is they're probably going to try and think, oh, convert them to grams. No, you don't need to. Kilograms is fine. And they maybe will forget to do the square in there. So here's my working out, and I bothered to do that even on the multiple choice question. The answer was C. Uh, they give you the equation in this case, but you still need to make sure you memorize them. Um, <laughs> I just wonder whether to plug my book, Memorize Equations for GCSE Physics, which you can find in the description, um, I'm sure, in my little Amazon store as well. It's really, really useful. So um, model of an energy level inside an atom. Okay, the arrows show up and down are electrons moving between the um, energy levels. Which electron emits radiation with the highest energy? So you need to know that the energy is proportional to the size of this gap. This, the energy is represented by the, the, um, the gap size. And you need to know if it's emitting, then the electron is moving down the energy levels. So it's D. The largest one where it's going down, so emitting a photon of radiation, is going down. This is energy levels um, of electrons within atoms. If a, an atom absorbs a photon of EM radiation, then the electron gets promoted up the energy levels. When it falls, then it gets emitted. It's quantum. That's one of the best bits of the GCC for me. I do have a video actually, it's called um, The Hardest Bits in the New GCSE, so that's well worth having a little look out for. I don't know if it's in the description, but um, if you search that Hardest Bits in the New GCSEs, um, there's a really good one where I go through all the hardest bits. I think that uh, if you're looking for the 8s and 9s, focus on those. Which sentence describes a renewable energy resource? Well, I, I always call this one that comes back as quickly as we can use it. An energy resource that can be replaced in your lifetime. Yeah, okay, that seems about right. Okay, I'm just checking the other ones. An energy resource that cannot be used again and again. No, it's definitely not that, is it? Energy source not made. No, it's not simple as that. An energy resource that will run out. No, definitely not. So the most right one is A in this case. So that's the answer they're going for in that case. Um, in the UK, three wires are used in domestic electricity supply. Is there the earth wire, live wire, neutral wire? Which sentence is correct? Uh, the alternating PD between the neutral and the earth is to, no, that's not true. Both of these are at zero, so it's not 230 volts. Um, the alternate PD between the neutral and the live is 230 volts. Okay, that's at zero and that's at 230 volts, so that seems right. Just check the other ones as well. Earth wire contains a fuse. No, the fuse is on the live wire for safety, so it's part right but part wrong. That is for safety, but it's on the live wire. The live wire is connected to the case for the appliance for safety. No, that's the earth wire. So, okay, the only obvious answer there is B. Okay, a student makes some estimates about distance and time. It seems really simple. Um, it seems really similar to one on the previous paper that we were looking at. A student uses this information to convert miles per hour to meters per second. So 30, they say a mile is about 1,500 meters. So first the times by 1,500, and then uh, an hour is about 3,500 seconds. So divide by 3,500 gives you B, which is 13. It comes out like 12 point something or the other, but um, you know you round to the closest possible one. A rule of thumb is just miles per hour into meters per second is divide by two or divide by 2.2 for a bit more accuracy. Okay, so just remember that. Um, that's especially for this one, how to you know convert miles per hour into meters per second is something you need to know how to estimate that. Um, table shows some information about transformers. Use the equation uh, PD across primary, that's that one, times current in primary, that's that one, is equal to PD in the secondary times current in the secondary. This is the transformer power equation. You don't need to remember it, you get given it. 
which is voltage on primary times current on primary equals uh, voltage on secondary times current on secondary. It basically says the power on one side of the transformer is equal to the power on the other. So if one increases, then the other one has to decrease to maintain this kind of uh, relationship. So all you need to do is find the row where this times this equals this times this, and you just you know just do that in the calculator. It, I've only done the first one, but if you check these, then they don't equal each other. So 200 times four is 800, 100 times eight is 800. So yeah, this is A is the correct one. A driver stops a moving car by pressing the brakes. Somebody was asking for um, stopping distance and stuff. Uh, so that's on this one. A driver stops moving the car by pressing the brakes. The engine is turned off and the driver gets out of the car. The driver returns to the car after 30 minutes. Which sentence is correct? The thermal store of the brakes increases. That seems about right, doesn't it, initially? Stop the car using the brakes. Yeah, okay. But read on. Double check. The thermal store of the driver. No, the driver doesn't heat up when they brake. Okay. The energy in the thermal store of the surroundings increases. Yeah, okay, that's seeming more a bit more like it. The energy of the thermal store of the tires increases. Yes, but after 30 minutes, which one's going to be the case? Well, the, the thermal store of the brakes is not going to be still um, high. Neither is the tires going to be so high. So the most right one is going to be C. Okay, so that's a bit, you have to eliminate the kind of distractors there to get that one right. Moving on, how are radio waves produced? Okay, this was a quite tricky one. A lot of people found this one quite difficult. But basically, radio waves are produced in little radio transmitters, and we, we send the electrons in the wires, terrible little drawing of little electrons in wires. We send them back and forwards, and they emit a, a wave of the same frequency as they've been sent backwards and forwards. Okay, um, so A, the alternating currents. Basically, they go backwards and forwards, and they emit radio waves. Okay, so that is the, the answer there. Um, it's not going to be by radio, it's not going to be by speaker, and it's not going to be by steady current, is it? So the kind of process of elimination is is the one that's going to help you solve that one. Look at the velocity time graph for a car. Um, so this velocity time graph shows the velocity starts quite high and then ends up at zero. Which graph shows the correct distance time graph for this car? So how is velocity represented on a distance time graph? Well, it's re represented by the gradient. Uh, <laughs> terrible spelling. Um, gradient. Suddenly live on camera and you can't spell gradient. Um, so, so well, this one has a steady gradient. So this one is a continue, all the, always the same velocity throughout. That's not that. This one has zero gradient, so zero velocity throughout. Well, that's not that either. This one starts with a high velocity and ends with no velocity. So decreasing velocity. Okay, that seems to make sense. Just double check the last one. This one starts with a low velocity and ends up with a high velocity. So no, it's not this one either. So the answer is C. So again, process of elimination. What do you know about this question? How can you eliminate the, the, the correct, the, um, the choices? Okay. A teacher adds 200 centimeter cube warm water to a beaker, wraps the beaker insulation, measures the temperature up after 10 minutes. Table shows the results of four different experiments, A, B, C, and D. So what does teachers do? We just sit and do experiments when you're not there. Which experiment gives the lowest rate of cooling? So which one cools down the slowest, basically? Is it um, low thermal conductivity and low thickness? Or is it high thermal conductivity and high thickness? Which is it? Okay, basically, lower the thermal conductivity, the better. So it's one of these two, the, the, um, you know, the lowest the rate of cooling is. And thicker, the better as well. So we would just want you to think about so the answer B. So we just want you to think about thermal conductivity and thickness when we're describing how rates of cooling are affected. And I've got a really good video from Iceland, which needs a bit of love actually. If you if you type in uh, cooling thickness and um, thermal conductivity or gorilla physics Iceland, I'm sure you'll find that one there where we talked about how to keep warm actually. So do the opposite to stop us cooling down the lowest rate of cooling if you like. Um, in Iceland. Right, okay, so now the actual questions. Describe how the graph shows this. What does it want us to describe? How the graph shows the water wave has a wavelength of six meters. Loads of people have made a mistake on this because they've also given you a height from peak to trough of six meters as well. So you need to kind of step, make sure you're doing it horizontally, the wave length, not the wave height. This is the amplitude from zero to, to three, but uh, we are interested in the length. Uh, so how does the graph show this? Because there's six meters from peak to peak. That would be good enough. Or you could have said there's six meters from one point to an identical point on the wave. Or you can, as I've done, you just show it on the graph or you can put 
look, here's X and here's Y, and there's six meters between X and Y, that's fine. If you're gonna show it on the graph, make sure your line goes exactly from peak to peak, or indeed exactly from one point past the next point where it crosses the axis to here, and show that's a wavelength. Okay, so make sure loads of people are gonna say, look, between like there and there is six meters. Well, no, that's not quite the case. Okay, I'll scribble it out just so you know that's not what we're talking about. It has to, that any lines drawn here have to go exactly from peak to peak. You should be able to measure that and that would be the wavelength. Yeah, definitely helpful for all exam boards, these two videos that I've done today, Neve. Okay, thanks a lot for this, the support as well. Um, make sure you do sub up and make sure you share it out with your buddies as well because they know that one of the worst things that people say to me is, oh, oh the day before the exam, I get a comment like, Oh, um, I wish I'd found you sooner. Yeah, because you can't consume all my stuff in like um, a, the day before the exam, can you? This is useful for all exam boards. Physics is the same. All the nine to one specs are very similar to each other. So thanks, Neve. I really appreciate it. Uh, calculate the speed of the water wave. You need to remember the wave speed equation is V equals F lambda. Wave speed is frequency times wavelength. So in this case, they've told you the frequency and this is why they've told you the wavelength in the previous one, so you need to use that. So 0 0.5 times six is three meters per second. Students use a, a ripple tank, meter ruler and a stopwatch. Draw, they draw a diagram, here it is. They didn't draw that, did they? Um, <laughs> explain how this equipment is used to measure the frequency of water waves. Okay, so explain how this equipment is used because so many people have kind of said what you need to do but not what which bit of apparatus to use. So you time 10 seconds with the stopwatch. You need both in this. Count the number of waves in 10 seconds and divide by 10 to give frequency in hertz. So you use the stopwatch, count the number of waves in 10 seconds, divide by 10 to give you the frequency. There are other ways you could do this. There's the long way around. You could measure the wave speed by timing one wave from here to here with the stopwatch and measuring how far it's gone and do distance over time to get the speed. Then you can do the wavelength with the ruler on the, on the wave pattern below. But these are longer way around than just doing it this way around. You could also try and time, try and count 10 waves and time that and then divide that by 10 to give you the time period. But this is the most straightforward way to memorize how do you work out frequency for this wave's pag. You just do um, count the number of waves in 10 seconds and divide by 10 to give the frequency. I've got a nice little video on that wave's pag coming soon. Okay, so this one is a Hooke's Law, another PAG experiment. Okay, you need to know your um, or required practicals in AQA. Uh, you need to know them really, really well, and you need to know how to evaluate them and how to process the results. So that we're hanging different cubes from the, um, the springs, measure the extension for each cube, look at the results, there they are. Okay, fine, plot the results, fair enough, we can do that. Now, I've plotted the results with my pencil, and you see I've made a couple of errors in plotting, and I've had to rub them out. And I am a teacher, and teachers don't make mistakes, do they? Well, this is the first time I've ever made a mistake. No, I'm, in all seriousness, get yourself a sharp pencil ready to go in the exam, uh, because your plotting accuracy needs to be half a small square, and your line of best fit needs to be half a small square accurate. Okay, that's how close your plotting accuracy needs to be. So double check it. You can see that I, I, when I check this, I'm within the correct half a small square. Okay, so that's correctly done now there. I don't think you're gonna make any mistakes of that, but do check. That's worth only one mark as well, and it took a couple of minutes to do. Use the results and the graph to show the spring constant is 35 newtons per meter. So, okay, this is, as I say, this is the result of this required practical, is the gradient of that graph is the spring constant. Or you need to remember the equation and rearrange for the spring constant k. k is force over extension. 7 over 20, oops, hang on a minute, 20 centimetres, look, and we want newtons per metre, so I have to cross that bit out there, and 7 divided by 0 0.2, so you can you can decide whether I did that on purpose to make a point, or whether um, I made the mistake straight away. And then it's telling you to calculate the energy transferred in the spring when the extension is 0 0.2 meters. This is why they've given you the spring constant. This is why they didn't just do calculate the spring constant because they're expecting you to use it for the next part of the question. So uh, that's, that's why it's a show that, right? Rather than just calculate it. Okay, so this is the equation. They give you that in the formula sheet, a half times the spring constant times the extension squared. So we just check all the units are okay. Yeah, they've given us 0.2 meters now. That's great. A half times 35 times 0.2 squared 
is 0.7 joules, okay? Um, just make sure you can type all that into the calculator, okay? 0.5 times 35 times 0.2 squared, it just squares that number at the end there, that's fine, 0.7. Okay, almost there now with this one. Oh, another six marker. Um, some Rachel just asked actually uh, about six markers, would there always be kind of like two smaller questions? Yeah, that's the way to think about them, I think. Um, so here's person A and person B, they've, been, they've got these graphs here of their kind of journey to a stop. They're both going at the same speed initially, you have to notice that, okay, when well, they've told you it, they made a point of telling you it, not just notice it from the graphs. Uh, the traffic lights on the road change to red, press the MBC, uh, press the brakes in the car, show how the velocity after blah, 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 blah. Right, the graphs are drawn using the same scale. Explain what the graphs show about how the cars stop. Well, stopping distance is thinking distance plus braking distance. Use values from the graph and calculations in your answer. So here's how, okay, I can spot that there's two mini sub questions. So the first one is just explain what, they, what the graphs show you about how the cars stop. So that is talking about how they show the thinking distance and the braking distance and the overall stopping distance. Then they've told us to use graphs and calculations. So the second part I'm gonna do in this, my second paragraph is actually a bunch of calculations. So first of all, let's have a little look at the graphs. Can you see how person A reacts quicker? Okay, they have a shorter reaction time. Now, because they both have the same uh, speed, their reaction time um, being shorter means the thinking distance is also shorter. And actually the thinking distance would be that area there. Area underneath a velocity time graph is the distance traveled. So you could also say that person A has got half the thinking distance of person B. And then, well, they then come to a stop over a longer time. And if you increase the time taken to stop, then you decrease the acceleration because acceleration is change in velocity over time. So this is basically what I've said in my first paragraph. Person A's got a short reaction time, one second, so therefore they have a short thinking distance, half that of person B, who had double the reaction time of A. Person A takes longer to break from 25 meters per second, so their deceleration is lower than B, so they've got a longer time okay, than, than, uh, than person B. Then I've gone on to say stopping distance is thinking distance plus braking distance, and we can calculate this using the area under the graph. So here I've done the, uh, person A, the area of the rectangle, plus the area of the triangle, and I can just type that all into the calculator. Let me show you that. So 25 times one, okay, plus the fraction 25 times eight, which is the time it took, but divide by two, because it's a triangle, 125 meters per second. Now you've probably got a similar calculator to this or the slightly old FX 95. Um, so that's the area of that plus the area of that is the total stopping distance. Okay, so that's that. And then I've done the same thing for the other one and it comes out at a slightly less stopping distance actually, even though the thinking distance were greater. And we can calculate the acceleration using the gradients of the graph and then I've just done the acceleration. Do the first one with you. So. 25 to zero, so the change in velocity is minus 25, and it's taken eight seconds. Just be careful you don't read off nine, but it's the, it's the how long it took to change from that to that, so it's nine seconds, so, so it's eight seconds, there we go. And um, uh, so it's minus 3.13 meters per second squared. So Tom, I'm thinking tomorrow I'll focus on some uh, A-level questions. Yeah, it'd be my pleasure, mate. Um, so the next one, minus, 24, minus 25 over four gives you minus 6.25 meters per second squared. So it's a deceleration, so it's a negative acceleration. Okay, uh, moving on, a couple more questions. So this question is about radiation. Okay, what's meant by the term half-life? So it's the average time taken, first mark. So a lot of people say, well, it's when it dec decreases by half. No, it's the time taken, a half-life is a time, time taken, for half the radioactive nuclei to decay. Or you could say for the activity to half. And we should say, we should really say the average time taken, although it's not, doesn't tend to be needed for the mark. We should say the average time taken because uh, radiation is completely random. So, you know, you can't, uh, 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 you can't influence it by external factors. So it's got a completely random um, situation. So it should be the average because you know, it takes large numbers of these things for it to be perfectly the exact same every time. 
Moving on though, um, which one has the longest half-life? Well, that's Q, because clearly that would, if they both start about the same, that would take a longer time for that radioactivity to half. Well, the half-life of R is somewhere around this one, isn't it? And this one hasn't even halved by the end of it here. But how, how are you gonna say that? Because the activity is higher for longer. Or you could say because the gradient is lower is perfectly acceptable way to do both of those. Okay, I don't think you're gonna have any trouble with that one. Iodine-131 is a radioactive isotope. Iodine-131 decays, emitting a beta particle. Write a balanced nuclear equation. Now, normally these are a lot easier because they um, they tend to tell you this already and you know give you this indication. You just have to sort of work out the blanks. But um, in this case, they've asked you just to work it out yourself. But it still starts in the same way. You need to remember the code for alpha and beta. Alpha is four and two, and beta is zero and minus one. You need to re recognize which one it is um, and uh, then work out the unknown numbers. So if we just do this, one through one, you're told it's beta, look. So you need to add that on the end. You don't know it's um, xenon yet. Okay, one through one is something plus zero. Well, okay, it's gotta be one through one again, hasn't it? Okay, and iodine, uh, sorry, 53 is something plus minus one. So that's 54. So this is, you know, say one of the trickier um, decay equation questions I've come across because you actually need to figure that out um, from scratch rather than just being, a, being, you know, rather than just filling the blanks. That's quite a nice question, I think. Okay, so xenon and the atomic number is 54. Okay, moving on. A uh, table shows how the activity of iodine decreases with time. Use the table to calculate the ratio activity after four days over activity after 20. So it's 3.2 over 0 0.8. It's the activity after four days over the activity after 20. And that's four. Now that's a funny way around to do this question again, because they're about to ask you what the half-life is, right? So this the ratio is that over that is, is four, or in other words, it's four to one. Okay, now that's a tricky one. Okay, so we're, they're going to use that answer to calculate the half-life. Well, if only one half-life had passed, it would be a ratio of two to one. So, so two half-lives must have passed because it's a ratio of four to one. You know, the, the, the later one is one is four times smaller than the previous one. So, mm, so that's been 16 days from after four days to 20 days. So that, and that's two half-lives. So one half-life is eight. Okay. Um, Tom, no, I'd go watch the, watch the other videos. Watch in the, the ones in the description, A-level kids, okay? Um, so the answer is eight. It's a funny way around to do it. Now I would have probably looked at the kind of, you know, numbers in the, the column here and tried to figure out a way of doing it with these numbers. I have to admit, you know, this even this would have confused me this way around. They've asked it, but you can manage it. The, notice there is no any of these that are actually half of the previous one, so they've been quite shrewd to to not give you uh, an activity which is half of of any other one. Um, you could kind of work it out because you can see that sixteen days to zero has it's not even quite um, a quarter of it, is it? So you have to use that previous answer to get this one. Tricky one. Okay, um, the table shows some information about electrical appliances. Okay, um, use the table to describe the relationship between power and resistance. So you don't even need to do much thinking here. You just need to say how it is. Power and resistance, what's the ratio, What's the relationship? Well, let's look for the highest power. That's the highest power and that's the lowest resistance. Let's look for the lowest power. That's the lowest power, that's the highest resistance. Do they all kind of line up? Yeah, they all kind of do. So as power increases, resistance decreases. Mark. There's not any complications about that. Everyone can get that answer, okay, without having much knowledge. Explain this relationship is a bit harder, isn't it? Use ideas about resistance. So you need to make a point about resistance. What happens as you decrease resistance? Well, higher current. That's your first mark. Lower resistance, higher current. And then explain the relationship between power and resistance. The power is proportional to current, so you, or you could have said that more current, more power. So this is the equation, power is current times voltage, or indeed you could have said power is current squared times resistance, 
um, and then it's not proportional, it's proportional to current squared, but this is if you if the voltage is fixed. And in homes where the voltage is fixed, it's always 230 volts. So I wouldn't worry too much about this one here, but you could have explained it in those terms as well. Okay, this is quite a tricky one, this one. The security light switched on for 45 minutes. Now I've straight away converted that into an actual number I can put into my calculator, because 45 minutes is three quarters of an hour, or 0.75 hours. And it's been on for seven days. So I've actually, again, I've converted into a time that I can actually use in this, in this question. Time is 5.25 hours. Calculate the energy transferred in kilowatt hours. So here's the equation they're given to me. I don't need to remember that. So what's the power? Well, it's the security light, which in the table is 500 watts. So that is 0.5 kilowatts. So now I've got my time, I've got my power. I can just write out my equation. Energy is power times time, which is 0.5 times 5.25 reach for the calculator because I don't want to do anything in my head that I can avoid so I can just go off thinking about football for a little while if I like and just let the calculator do all of the thinking 2.625 kilowatt hours okay I hope that makes sense now again here's one look this has got nothing to do with the whole rest of the question so even if you really bugged out and you really struggled on the rest of this question you can still get these marks here Direct voltage, okay, sorry, explain the difference between direct voltage and alternating voltage. Two marks, it's just something you're going to need to memorize. It seems to come up loads as well. Direct voltage is always the same direction. Alternating voltage changes direction. It's good enough. Or you could say direct voltage is always either positive or negative. And alternating voltage changes between positive and negative. An electric drill does not need the nerf wire. Explain why. Well, if you look back at it, they've given you some information about it. No, they really haven't. Um, but I think you're going to have to work it out. Something that doesn't need an earth wire is something that's double insulated. It's just something you need to kind of memorize then, which is appliances. A lot of appliances don't need earth wires these days because they are double insulated. In other words, they have plastic cases. So we don't need to attach an earth wire to the case because there's no chance of you getting shock from the case. The electric iron is plugged into the mains and switched on. The thermal, the temperature of the iron increases. Describe this process. Use ideas about energy stores. So here's this new paradigm about energy that you need to make sure you're using. You're not talking about types of energy, you're talking about stores, okay? So now, when I was thinking of this, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about the electrical store first, okay, because it's mains. But actually they've bothered to tell me about the mains electricity produced in a power station that burns coal. So that's a chemical store. That's my starting store. And the temperature increases, that's my thermal store. So I have to get from my chemical store of the coal to my thermal store of the kettle. And actually if I put those two marks, then do you know what, I've, I've got two marks already. The chemical store of the coal decreases, or the chemical store is emptied, I don't much like that term myself. The chemical store of the coal decreases. The energy is transferred by electrical working and the thermal store of the kettle increases or is filled. Now you could have said that by the law of conservation of energy, the decrease in chem equals the increase in thermal store. Now, although that's true, and the, the, the law of conservation is a law, it always takes um, takes place. You know, you don't get something for nothing. You always, energy can't be created or destroyed. It's just transferred from store to store. I don't really like this applied to this one because the chemical store of the coal is so much farther away and there's so many transfers to get to the thermal store of the iron that I really don't, you know, they're, they're not perfectly equal because nothing's 100% efficient. But you could have got a mark for just for stating the law of conservation of energy. So bear that in mind, just get the law of conservation of energy. If you think it's relevant, get it in there. Right, here we go then. Um, last question on this one. A scientist completes an experiment to determine the specific heat capacity of water, uses an immersion heater to increase the temperature of the water. Suggest two ways to ensure the scientist obtains accurate results. First one, the obvious one is insulate or cover the beaker. Okay, you can serve either of those if you like. 
Um, and the second most obvious one, I think, is read the thermometer at eye level or 90 degrees to the scale. That avoids parallax. Okay. Um, there are other ones you could have said. You could have said stir the water. You could have said um, make sure the immersion heater is completely covered. It is. Uh, you could have said um, don't lift the thermometer out when taking the reading. You could have said uh, use a digital thermometer. You could have said make sure the thermometer only touches the water and not the sides of the container or the immersion heater. And you could have said make sure you measure the mass of the water before and after. But to be honest, these are the two I'd like you to think about, the obvious ones. In this experiment, insulating the beaker is the most important one. And then the inaccuracy by parallax by, uh, is just knowing how to use things with analog scales. Now there's a graph here that we're going to need to use in a second. Okay, so let's look what I have to do with it. Is there a random error in the experiment? Explain. So there's two points. You have to get both for the one mark. So is there a random error? Does it look like they're scattered all over the place? No, it really doesn't. So there's only, um, you know, in this case, there's not really any random error. Okay, so why not? Because the points lie close to the uh, line of best fit. If there's a lot of random error, then you get points, you know, that are all over the shop, all over the... Um, you know, very far away from the line of best fit. It doesn't necessarily mean it's inaccurate, but you know, it doesn't, it's, and they're not, they're pretty much lying right on it. The scientist thinks point labeled B is an anomaly. Is she correct? Explain again, you've got to say no and the point. Point labeled B, is it an anomaly? Well, it's not a million miles away. It's not, it's not significantly far away from the line. So no, anomalies need to be significantly far from the line of best fit or significantly far away from repeats. So no, and that's the reason why. Calculate the gradient or slope of the graph. Now here's another time where you need to be accurate to half a small square. So look really closely. The rise up to there from zero up to there is 9.5 degrees Celsius. Just check my units there. And the run is 300 seconds. So a gradient is the rise over the run and I've been nice and accurate with that. 9.5 over 300 gives me 0 0.032. Okay, there was a little bit of a range in between those, but that's how you do that one. Now, the scientists write down the results. This one, if you're looking out for this one, who was it, uh, WWE plug. Um, this one is one of the grade nine questions. The scientist writes down more results. 0 0.5 kilogram, that's the mass. Power is that one, 12.8 uh, watts. Use the equations, energy transferred is power times time. Change in thermal energy is mass times specific heat capacity times change in temperature. Now, essentially, the point of this one is that the energy transferred to the water is equal to the energy in in uh, the change in thermal energy, right? The energy transferred by the electrical heater is equal to the thermal energy increase of the water. So you just have to make these two equal to each other. Power times time equals mass times specific heat capacity times change in temperature. Get a mark for that. Now it says then use the result and the gradient you calculate in part C. Now that's gonna throw a lot of people off because it's, I've tried doing this with the gradient. You can do it with the gradient, but it, it's really messy. I wouldn't recommend anyone does it with the gradient. And actually in the mark scheme, they haven't mentioned use of the gradient at all. So they must've realized it was a bit of a silly way around to ask this question. It basically, you, you can do it, um, I'll do it really quickly for you, because just if you think about this equation, just leave C where it is. Uh, you get power times time over mass times temperature change. Okay, the gradient above is temperature change over time. So you'd have to put that in inverted to work out C. So it's just, it's actually an ugly way to do the math. So we're not going to bother with that. So what I would suggest you do is you've got this expression here. Just input all the numbers that you know, and you'll get a mark for that. Just double check they're all in the right kind of, um, the right kind of uh, units. Then, and you can see that I made a mistake, this was just calculated driving error there um, to get 540. So I've just gone back to basics again. I've left see where it is, divided both sides by 0 0.1, divided both sides by 9.5 to give me this. Put all of that in the calculator in a 1-up, 12.8 and the fraction times 300, yeah over 0 0.1 times 9.5 and then hit the equals button and the D 4, 40, 42. 
4042 and rounding 4042. That's my final answer. Now, is that sensible? Is it a good thing to think about? Okay, well, I don't know if you know, like that um, the, the specific heat capacity of water is, is quite high, it's 4,200. So yeah, it's roughly sensible. It's a little bit beneath it, but in terms of experimental error, that seems about right. Okay, um, it's always worth doing that descent check in your answers, does it seem about right? Initially, I was gonna get something around in the order of 100, and that wouldn't have been right. So I stopped there because I was thinking, oh, hang on a minute, that doesn't seem about right. So always sense check your answers. That's the end of the paper there. That, was, well, that one was quite a tricky one. Um, that's been what, some loads of GCSE physics questions today. Tomorrow, uh, if you like, I will focus on some A-level stuff. I don't know if that's gonna be a popular choice or not. Um, <laughs> But uh, you guys just need to get on with it. Do tackle some areas of uh, GCC or A-level that you find really tricky. Okay, leave me comments if you want some specific things. Okay, some people already have, that's wonderful. Leave me comments in the real thing if you want some specific things, I can, go, I can touch on them tomorrow as well. Um, and there are more suggested videos in the description. It's been lovely spending a bit of time with you all this afternoon, okay? Thanks a lot for watching. Um, I really hope it helped.